black holes. They're the true supermassive monsters of space, swirling vortexes that nothing, not even light, can hope to escape from if it strays just a little bit too close. And if that wasn't enough, they're completely invisible. Studied extensively but little understood, they're among the most bizarre objects in the universe. The stuff of fantasy, except they're very real. And if there was a single strongest driver that sets our curiosity and imagination to run wild, it's when we can't see something and can't see where it leads. What are these giants actually made of? Why are we really so captivated by them? What's the true secret of the singularity? Is it hiding a pathway to other universes or a kind of celestial object the math says might be out there, but that we've never seen before and can't prove? And one day, could wormholes become our favorite method of interstellar travel? Join me as we unravel some of these questions and more and enter the Codex Legendarium. I'm Shelby Melanson. The event horizon. It's what makes a black hole a black hole. Imagine the outermost solid surface of a planet like ours. The ground we walk on, the transition between the physical start of the object and the atmosphere, or the gaseous stuff surrounding it. The equivalent of this for a black hole is more like a boundary. It's not solid, but it is the point of no return. The place where, for any matter or even light, it's pretty much, quote, abandon all hope, ye who enter here. Once you enter the event horizon, there is no escape. Outside of that border is the accretion disk. The word accretion is basically a catch-all blanket term used in astrophysics for something that does exactly that, catches all, aka consumes matter, and in this case light, from its celestial neighborhood within a certain radius. The accretion disk is how the black hole grows. As gas and dust and light get caught in the black hole's gravity, what happens looks a lot like a hyperbolic funnel, where something circles slowly moving towards the center, and spins faster and faster as it goes. The black hole's disk works the same way. Matter and light makes its way into the center until it eventually reaches the event horizon, never to emerge. Just outside the event horizon is the event horizon shadow. It's essentially a dark zone, roughly twice the size of the black hole's actual surface, and this is the place where any light that passes through it gets captured and distorted. This mainly happens because of gravitational lensing, when the gravity around an object is so massive that it literally bends and distorts the light itself, because even light speed isn't enough to escape its pull. As for where all that light ends up as it bends, that's where the photon sphere comes in, a thin ring or rings of light at the very edge of the event horizon shadow. Next is another light effect, Doppler beaming or relativistic beaming, as in Einstein's theory of relativity, Ring a bell? This is where we see the theory in action. When particles in the accretion disk are moving at just slightly less than the speed of light, they get distorted in a way that makes one side of the disk look brighter than the other. One side looks vibrant and blue, the other looks dim and red. It works like a more dramatic version of what happens with sound. Think about when a fire truck drives past with its siren on, and as it approaches, it sounds super loud and very high pitched but immediately after it passes you, it sounds quieter, duller, and lower. Outside the black hole's event horizon and disk is one of the most extreme environments in the entire cosmos. It makes, say, the surface temperature on Neptune a warm and toasty at negative 353 degrees Fahrenheit, that's negative 214 degrees Celsius, by the way, seem like a pleasant breeze in comparison. <laughs> it's called the corona a cloud of particles orbiting that black hole just under the speed of light. It's full of superheated billion-degree plasma and emits extremely powerful X-ray radiation. But that's about all we know about it. It's an extremely mysterious zone, and even basic traits like its size elude us. Not to mention mysterious cases where we've watched a corona vanish, only to just reappear later on. Even NASA says we're still trying to figure it out. Speaking of black hole parts we don't understand, we have something called particle jets. Essentially, a small amount of light and matter gets rerouted and sent straight up and away from the event horizon, just before it reaches the point of no return. 
creating a thin geyser that, for large black holes, can beam matter and radiation hundreds of thousands of light years out into space. Okay, now we know what a black hole is and what it's made of. We can talk about the part you're actually here for, the center of a black hole, the singularity. Remember Einstein's theory of general relativity? At its core, the idea tries to explain gravity and the part of space-time where gravity gets a little distorted. Put simply, it's the theory that gravity is not an invisible force that makes objects drawn to each other. Instead, it's that space is actually curved and wraps around objects that have mass. And the more mass something has, the more gravity warps the space around it. So basically, gravity is the manifestation of how space curves. Many years later, American physicist John Wheeler described it like this, quote, space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. Not only does this shape space, it actually shapes time too. But we're gonna go down that uh, wormhole in a future episode because there's just too much to talk about. You can imagine black holes have some pretty mind-blowing effects on gravity considering they're the most dense objects in existence, literally the end-all be-all of density because there's just so much matter squished inside them. General relativity takes that a step further. It predicts that at the centermost point of a black hole, there is so much matter squished into that single point that all matter is crushed into infinity, or infinite density. This limit is where gravity, physics, quantum mechanics, and pretty much everything as we know it just breaks down. And because of that infinite density, the space-time curvature we talked about, that becomes infinite too. Here's the trouble. Plenty of scientists, like astrophysicist Paul Sutter, say, quote, there is no such thing as infinitely dense. So if it's not the singularity at the center of a black hole, what is it? NASA says it could either be a physical structure or just a mathematical one. But the truth is, we don't know. That's not all general relativity has up its sleeve. Einstein was never totally happy with the uncertainty of what happens when gravity breaks down, especially when it came to his work on quantum mechanics. His math only had estimates for what happens at that point, not ironclad solutions. So in 1935, he wanted to change that and came up with another possibility. He and an Israeli-American physicist named Nathan Rosen published a paper called The Particle Problem in the General Theory of Relativity. The paper takes a closer look at matter, electricity, and how electrons get charged. In it, Einstein and Rosen started with an equation called the Schwarzschild solution. It came from a German astronomer by the same name in 1916, just a year after Einstein's original theory. It was basically a fix for the issue with general relativity, the part that Einstein wasn't happy with. The new solution offered a precise explanation of what happens when gravity breaks down. How? by describing the gravitational field of a spherical object that doesn't rotate. And you know what else is a large, non-rotating sphere with huge mass? Yeah, black holes. Figuring that out basically laid the groundwork for what we now understand about black holes. Back to Einstein and Rosen's paper, using the new solution, they altered the equations to remove the part that accounted for the curvature of singularity. What they got was a mathematical depiction of two flat sheets parallel in space, but linked by a bridge. They called it the Einstein-Rosen bridge, but you've probably heard it by its punchier name, the wormhole equation. Theories that came after this have, unfortunately, raised some issues. The biggest one came from a guy who actually coined the term wormhole, theoretical physicist John Archibald Wheeler from Princeton University. We mentioned him earlier. Through his studies in the 1950s, he reasoned that the Einstein-Rosen bridge would be massively unstable and would probably collapse immediately if one even opened, meaning no matter could travel through it, and anything that attempted the trip from one singularity to another would be destroyed completely. Here's the thing. That answer just wasn't good enough for other scientists, and at the top of that list is astronomer and writer Carl Sagan. Yeah, you've probably heard that name before. Back in the 1980s, he wanted to work out a scientifically plausible way to make wormholes legit for his novel and later movie, Contact. So with some help from theoretical physicist Kip Thorne and his graduate student Michael Morris at Caltech, they theorized that wormholes could actually be stabilized. Enough so that this is the title they gave their paper. Quote, 
wormholes in space-time and their use for interstellar travel. The secret ingredient? A hypothetical kind of exotic matter, or matter we haven't discovered yet, with negative energy. Meaning each unit of it would have less than zero energy, negative energy. Because of that, it would actually repel gravity like trying to push the wrong sides of cosmic magnets together. Here's the catch. This kind of energy has only ever been created in super small quantities in labs. It has never been found naturally, and because of that, plenty of scientists just toss the idea right out the window, suggesting that even if it were possible to find this matter and stabilize a wormhole, sending matter, or say, a person or a spacecraft traveling through it would destabilize it all over again. Thorne and Morris acknowledged that this kind of exotic matter would basically rewrite deeply cherished understandings of general relativity. Quote, however, it is not possible today to rule out firmly the existence of such material, and quantum field theory gives tantalizing hints that such material might, in fact, be possible. A fun side note on this, <laughs> Thorne's theories on black holes actually form the logic basis for the movie Interstellar. He published a book all about it called The Science of Interstellar and actually was staffed as an advisor to the film during its shooting in 2014. Okay, let's say it was possible to stabilize a wormhole enough to travel through it. Where would the matter go? Remember that Schwarzschild solution we talked about earlier? Well, part of the issue is that once a particle of matter gets into the black hole's event horizon, the math for what happens to that particle basically turns into spaghetti. Pun intended. <laughs> but if there was an alternative that could tell us where that particle goes, enter the Eddington-Finkelstein coordinates. The short version is that this theory tweaks some extremely complicated math to describe what happens to particles at the event horizon. They fall down a one-way street. And on the other side, well, the thing about general relativity equations is that they're symmetrical. So running them backwards gives you something called a white hole. It's the mirror image of a black hole. Instead of a celestial object that nothing can escape, a white hole is something nothing can enter. It forces out what a black hole takes in, and they're described as time reversals, created by flipping the direction of time itself. Think of it like this. A white hole would be like watching a video of a black hole's motion, but in reverse. According to the theories and the math, a white hole is the exit of a black hole. Theories like the Penrose diagram use geometry to support the possibility of their existence. And that comes from Sir Roger Penrose, mathematician, physicist, philosopher from England, not to mention a Nobel physics laureate, so he knows a thing or two. Another similar theory came out in 2010, thanks to theoretical physicist Nikodem Poplowski. In short, the white hole could work like a cosmic tunnel, a backdoor into another universe. But traveling through one is a one-way street for matter. If you can go through, you can't come back. He even theorizes that this could be how universes are born and how they grow. But there are issues with this theory too. Black holes happen when giant stars collapse, squishing a huge amount of matter into a small space. But we don't currently have a way to explain how a white hole could form. And even though the math allows for it, the chance of creating one essentially that doesn't immediately collapse might be slim. For right now, there's still so much we don't know about black holes, from the true nature of what's at their center to theories about what might happen if we one day had the means to stabilize one and try to travel through it. For now, the scientific front is stuck at the mathematical drawing board and trying to simulate tiny versions of them at the lab is the best we can do. Not to say that's not impressive. But as we wonder about wormholes and intergalactic travel, I think there's something to be said for why we're so drawn to it. Pretty much everyone, even mildly interested in space, will say the same thing. Black holes are awesome. They terrify us, yet excite our curiosity like nothing else. But why do we feel that way? It's because we're drawn to the idea of an endless, terrifying void, perhaps. Or is it that, even subconsciously, we wonder whether all the light that vanishes into the event horizon exists somewhere else? A dimension of infinite light, perhaps. In my research for this video, I stumbled on one artist's rendition that compared black holes to the human eye, and on a greater scale, the eye of God. And if you ask me, that's a nice metaphor for what we might call the point of unknowing. 
the barrier we can't see past, where science just can't tell us anything more. A lot of Renaissance-era scientists, especially da Vinci, hint to us through their work that they believed there is a point where science crosses over with art, with beauty, and with God. Likewise, what if the event horizon reminds us of the beauty and mystery of our own consciousness? A giant well that nothing can be removed from, but inside lies all of our experiences, memories, and everything that makes us who we are. I can think of no more fitting a place to end than with one more piece of wisdom from Einstein. Quote, the more I learn, the more I realize how much I don't know. What do you think is inside a black hole? Are they simply astronomical anomalies where math and matter break down? Or do you think we'll one day find proof of a real wormhole and learn to travel through it? Let me know what you think in the comments and stay tuned for a future discussion on this. In my research, I found so much more about black holes and space-time that I cannot wait to share with you. And of course, if you enjoyed this deep dive into mysteries, myths, culture, and science, drop us a like and subscribe. Until next time, stay curious. Thank you.